You see these speed bumps? I'm going to guide you over those speed bumps. See, we're, we're not left to do it alone. It says, you see, for us few who have chosen to serve and give our hearts and lives to Jesus, we have chosen the narrow gate. And in choosing that narrow game, we understand that this road we are taking is an easy one. Living our faith and standing firm in our beliefs goes completely against what the world beliefs are and the world's way of living. See, our, our way of, of living our lives is totally opposite if we were to take that wide game. We're asked to live in a, a totally opposite way of it. See, as Christians, we're challenged daily. We're challenged physically. We're challenged mentally, and we're challenged spiritually. And we don't always get it right. I know I don't. But maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm the, one, the only one who makes mistakes. <laughs> Yet, I'm thankful, and I'm grateful that I have a father who loves, forgives me, and who shed his blood for me that I can get it right next time. Amen. A father that loves me, and that would lead me to walk this narrow road alone. See, I told you earlier that he, 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 he left us an advocate, which was the Holy Spirit. And if you turn to John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, he tells us here, if you love me, obey me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads, it, who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it, it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives in you now and later he will be in you. Because, because he lives with you now and later will be in you. See, that broad, that broad, that white gate that leads to the worldly ways, it tells us right here that the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. See, if we choose the broad gate and we think in the way the world thinks and choosing to live our lives the way the world lives it, we're not looking for God. We're not looking for God to lead us, to help us in our decisions. We're not leading... We're not, we're not allowing God to, to be a part of our lives because we're caught up in everything else that the world is, that's going on in the world. You know? Why, why, look, those who choose the broad, road are, the broad road are choosing to live in the world that doesn't have time. See, the world doesn't have time for God. It doesn't want anything to do with God living a worldly life. The reason I say that because if, you, if we choose to live, if the world chooses to live a, a godly life, then guess what? That means that it would have to love everybody. That we would even have to love those who the world says doesn't deserve to be loved. See, but Christ calls us to love everybody no matter what. Right? See, but the world says, I'll love you only if you love me back. See, that's one of the challenges that we go through on that, that narrow road. Are we willing to love somebody who's not willing to love us back? Living in a world that would mean that you would have to forgive somebody. That in itself is a challenge for a lot of us. So why would the world want to act, you know? They don't want to, the world doesn't want to forgive anybody. If someone does wrong, guess what? They hold that against you for a lifetime. How many of us can actually live our lives and, 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 and somebody who doesn't go to church not ever would remind you of all the wrong things that you did? Right? Amen. It's like, like the Lord has wiped our slate clean, but the world just continues to pile everything that we've done on top of each other, on top of each other. They look at your walk down with the Lord, and guess what? They just wait for you to fall because they know that they're, they're going to use what you used to do against you. Living in the world, we have to ask for forgiveness for those that we have wronged. Wow. How many of us have that to, to go up to somebody and say, the world doesn't want to 
I don't give you, hey man, I, 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 I'm, I'm wrong for what I did to you, please forgive me. No. But us as Christ and living in Christ and Christ living in us, we need to make sure that we don't have anybody having any unforgiveness towards us or us not being able to forgive others. It would mean putting God before everything and giving up some of the things that we have become accustomed to. The world doesn't want to give up anything that it's become accustomed to. Right? I said earlier, if we're out there and we have no relationship with God and we have Christ, we don't have Christ in our lives and we're living and we're doing what we want, man, we don't want to give up the things that why would I want to give why would the world want to give up anything that that for church, that's the way they See, God doesn't come first. See, but taking the narrow gate, we put God first. Right? Amen. It would mean severing relationships. We know are good for us. You bring somebody to church who's just new to church and, and here's the big one. Living together and not being married. That will run people out of church. Right? If you were to go up to a brother or sister church knowing that they weren't married but they were living together and you were telling them, you were to tell them, and guess what, man, you know, it's not right in, in the eye of God. You know, you're sitting against God. Most likely next week they won't be here. See, sometimes we're, we're, sometimes we're going to be put in a situation where we have to put our relationship with God before our, our worldly relationships. Amen. Right? See, and the world sees something wrong with that. See, the world sees something wrong with us loving God first. See, we know as Christians, and we know as, as Christ followers, we know through the Word and, 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 and how we read the Word that there's an order to things. Right? It goes God, husband, wife, children. Right? But living in the world, it goes themselves, whatever is next is important, whatever is next, and if they got time for God, they'll put them on the list. But if God interferes with anything else, then they don't have time for God. I'm too busy for God. The world is moving too fast for God. See, we're called to slow down. Be still. Be patient. The world is moving too fast. It wants to get from point A to point B and not have anything distracted or anything interfere with what it wants to do. It would mean accepting correction. I know before I had a relationship with God, I didn't like to be corrected. I was always right. <laughs> right? We were always right. What do you mean? No, I was, I'm right. Correction? No, I didn't like correction. You go out there and you try to correct somebody, that might be fifth being thrown. Right? See, but as Christians, we're, we're called to, to be able to be correct. Especially when we're not doing something that we're, we're doing something that we're not supposed to be doing. The world wants nothing to do with any of these things that I mentioned. So if there is no God, see, so to the world, if there is no God, then there is no Holy Spirit. And if there is no Holy Spirit, there is no conviction. And if there is no conviction, there is no righteousness. If we look out into the world right now, we're, the world is missing conviction more than ever. More than ever. Right now, the world is doing everything in its power to push God out of everything that we know. From the government, schools, to, you can't even read it, uh, uh, an example, like Brother Rudy would say, a commercial. The other day, I saw an interview with Kirk Cameron. He wrote a new children's book. And it's a biblical children's book. It teaches the children you know, it's, it's a biblical children's book. So it's 
Well, he reached out to 50 libraries in the United States of America, the U.S. And he was denied by all 50 of them to, because what he wanted to do is he wanted to do a, a, a reading for an hour with the children and read at the library. They do this, you know, libraries let, let people do this when they, when they write a book. Well, they denied him because it was faith-based and it was about God. But yet on the calendar, they had transgender, uh, no, they had, um, What's uh, the word I'm looking for? Um, no, no, they addressed the women and just drag. like the drag. They had drag queen out. So they let the drag, the drag queens come in, read to the children about, you know, being able to choose, you know, you know, if you're a boy or a girl, that, that, you know, they, they're able to do this for an hour. The library is approved that. So, so what, I, what I'm saying is, what I was saying is, if you look, the world is doing everything to push God away from us and open the door for all the worldly beliefs to come in and be fed to us and be fed to our children. It doesn't want anything to do with God, and and that's a scary thing. That's why it's very important that we we stay read up, we stay prayed up, and we we instill the Word of God into our kids and make sure our kids are here. They might not be here all the time, but at least they're here once a week. At least they know who God is. They know that God loves them. They know what Jesus did for them on the cross. This is what we got to feed them because out in the world, they're not going to feed them this. They want to shut the doors to our churches if you let them. I mean, in Israel, they're, they're, they're banning Christianity. The world wants nothing to do with God. So all these things that I mentioned that, that we're called to do, forgive, to love, to, to be able to be corrected, all this stuff that we're called to do, the world wants nothing to do with it. Wait till the rapture comes in, we're going to want Yeah. Exactly. But then it's too late. It's too late. I really believe right now, right now I really believe that God is calling us and the church to wake up because there's a great har there's a great harvest of souls in the great tribulation, but they're gonna they're gonna have to go through some really, some really bad stuff, man. There'll be a great harvest of souls, and most yeah. of them will be from Israel, you know. What did they call them? I read an article the other day. It was called uh, Tribulation Saints. Yeah, that's what they're gonna be called, Tribulation Saints. Those are gonna be the people who give their life to Jesus after everybody else has been taken. Because guess what? Now they see, hey man, this was for real. <laughs> now Lord, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to give my heart to you. Yeah. But now guess what? You get your head long. chopped off, man. Yeah. Now you got to run from the mountains. Right? Don't wait. Don't wait. The Lord says to seek him while he can still be found, while he's still near. Exactly. And by choosing to never get, we understand that God calls us to live our lives in a total opposite way. The world puts everything before God, but we are, put, we are called to put God before everything. We understand when we're struggling, our needs or need answers, we seek God first, but the world seeks answers and questions from everywhere else but God. Think about that. How many times? I know I've done it. I'm guilty of it. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. If I have, if I, if there's something I need answered, there's a question that I have, I'll open up Google first instead of opening up a Bible. Mm. Right? See, but the world opens up Google first because Google knows everything. Google's God to the world. <laughs> See, but it doesn't know more than our God. See, the word, the word of God has everything that we need in it. I know I have questions. I open up my word and just a scripture that I read this morning before I go to work answered what the, the question that I had. Amen. Right? Matthew 6, 33, if you'll go there. Seek first. The world seeks questions from everywhere else 
from God, but we're supposed to seek answers from God. In Matthew 6, 33, it tells us, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and righter, and he will give you everything you need. Amen. Everything you need. Amen. You need answers? God will give them to you. That's right. You need healing? God will give it to you. He's a God of miracles, right? If whatever you need, God will give it to you. But it says, seek first the kingdom of God. Are we seeking first the kingdom of God? God will provide us everything we need to get through whatever it is we're dealing with. We just need to seek the kingdom of God first. And that's where a lot of us are making a mistake. A lot of us are making a mistake. A lot of our brothers and sisters are making a mistake. But guess what? It, it, at times, it just because it just we're caught up in everything that's going around us, we're just soaking. We're so overwhelmed. We're, you know, we're exhausted. You know, whatever it is, it, it just, it's instinct. To, to, it's, it's human nature to, to, to seek some, an answer for something else. You know what I'm saying? But us as, as believers, as Christians, we have to know it is still that it, we need to seek God first. And the operative word is need, not want. Need. And it said, and he will give you everything you need. Sometimes we can get so caught up with how the world is moving around us and how fast it's moving that we, here's the, here's the thing. We get caught up in how fast everything is going in this world that we ourselves can get caught up in it. And, and then we can begin to, and then we expect God to move just as fast. And what I'm saying is, we, 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 we're praying, we're seeking, and he's not answering. See, what did I think it was pastor or somebody that said, the world has the microwave mentality where they just want it real quick. You want to cook your dinner fast, put it in for a minute, and you want to eat in a minute. See, the, like I said, the world moving so fast, it wants to move from point A to point B and get there the quickest way it can. It doesn't have time for anything else. See, at times we can get caught up like that. And at times we can expect God to move like that. And guess what? When he's not moving fast enough, what happens? And we start trying to walk out and do it ourselves. Right? And I'm going to tell you right now, if you start to walk out and try to do it yourself, you're going to mess it up even more. Amen. See, there's something that God wants to teach us. See, God wants us to be patient. He wants to teach us patience. See, we have to be patient. We can't allow ourselves to get caught up in how fast the world is going. We need to be able to be patient and slow ourselves down. Sometimes if we're moving too fast, we can't hear God speaking to us. We walk too fast to hear him. You hear that? You ever heard that fly go by? It goes, Doo. like a fly go by your ears. Sometimes we're moving so fast, God's voice sounds like that. Amen. You know, we have to slow down and just let God speak to us. Be patient. In Psalms 37, 7, he tells us right here, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret, or fret about their wicked schemes. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Just because he hasn't answered your prayer yet doesn't mean that he's not going to answer you. Maybe if he answers you right now, you might not be ready for it. Or you'll think you did it on your own and you didn't need him. In his own time. God has a time for everything. Our time is different. Like I said, it just, our inner clock expects it to happen now. But 
But what if he's trying to teach us something as we're waiting? Amen. He's always trying to teach us something, especially when he's, when he's calling us to be patient. And don't worry about evil people who prosper and fret about the wicked. Why does God call us to be patient? That's the question. Why does he call us to be patient? God wants to produce patience in us to slow us down and to show us how to trust him more. God does not test us just for the sake of testing us, but he tests us to teach us to walk in his way and trust in him. See, in my patience, I'm just trusting, look, I know I haven't got it yet, but I know, Lord, that you're going to give it to me. If I'm in need of it. Not because I want it, but if I'm in need of it, I know and trust that if, I, if I'm patient, I know you're going to give it to me. See, that's, that, that's, what, that's what we're learning out of being patient. But there's so much more that you want to teach us how to be patient, and we just can't. For an example, how many of us, and I know I'm not the only one, how many of us have been traveling on the freeway, and you don't even realize it because you're so zoned, and you're, you know, they teach you to keep up with the traffic, right? You're keeping up with the traffic. You look down, and all of a sudden you realize, man, I'm going 90, 95 miles an hour. Right? And just at that moment, you know, I know I've been frustrated. You get those people who get in the fast lane and then they slow it down to like 70 and, and everybody's just flying and, you're, and they're in the fast lane. And I know I've been saying, man, did you learn? Where'd you get your license? They didn't teach you that everybody's slow, slow traffic to the right. But then you realize five minutes later you pass the CHP. <laughs> At that moment, you're like, thank you, Lord, for putting this car in front of me because he just saved me a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, see, what I'm saying is at times we can try to keep up with the flow. The world is going at a certain pace and we can get zoned out. We can get distracted and not realize that we're trying to keep up with what the world's doing. See, God does the same thing with us too. He sees how fast we're going, and he sees that we're in danger, and that we're just gonna we're we're, we're going into more trouble than we than we need to be in. Yes, at that moment he'll throw something. At us. You know, it might it might be something that that just stops us in our tracks. Like man, it's, it could be something in, in our lives where you know we might lose a loved one or a CHP. Or we might lose a job. Or a relationship might break up. Or you might not be friends with somebody that you've been friends with forever. Maybe that something that will make you stop and slow down and be like, okay. Right? He'll do that. So sometimes he'll throw that slow, that slow moving car in front of you because he sees that you're not being patient enough. You're not trusting in him. He'll throw a pothole here, he'll throw a pothole there, a speed bump here, a speed bump there. Just for us to slow down and be patient. See, through patience, God teaches us so much more. There's so much more that we learn through being patient. Not only does patience teach us to trust God more, but it also allows us to take on the very character of God. And what I mean by that is, look, if you turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, this is, this is what patience produces. This is what patience also teaches us. See, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. What's this next word? Patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Right there, patience. Through patience, we learn all these things. We learn how to love. We learn to have joy in our hearts. We learn to walk in peace. 
you know? Sometimes the tragedies that we go through, it's that peace that we, we've gotten, that we've learned, that gives us peace to understand, you know, we, got, we lost loved ones, but we know because they had a relationship with God where they're at. Amen. 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 I always go back to, to my mother. She was a prayer warrior. She was a woman of God. She prayed for me constantly. So when I lost my mom, it was sad to lose her. And at the same time, I had joy. Because I knew where she was at. I know where she's at. I know she received the keys to the kingdom. Right? See, patience, we, 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 we get that also for patience. It tells us there, all that stuff. But I'll tell you right now, if we're all careful, we can fail to produce this kind of food in our life. We have to be careful. Christian, we, we, can, we can be influenced and caught in the things of this world and we can, we can fail in producing these kinds of fruits. Sometimes we're moving so fast we can get impatient. Next thing you know, the person that got out next to us in the, at the stoplight, my, my wife's probably going to smile and laugh at me right now. Because I had to ask for forgiveness the other day. I had to. And we got to church and I think it was Sunday morning and Pastor brought it up and he preached on it and she looked at me and she said, you have to have the conviction. Yeah, I did. <laughs> as soon as I did, I, Lord, forgive me. Either that or you heard everything you said. Lord, forgive me. I was impatient. We can fail to produce these things at times if we're not if we're not uh, careful. If we're influenced and get caught up in the things of this world. See in Colossians 2 8, I'm gonna close right now with this one pretty soon. It says, Do not let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Do not let anyone capture you with empty philosophy. Do not let the world deceive you. Do not let the world entice you. Do not let the things of this world influence anything. To do. We don't want anything to do. I told you earlier the way the world thinks. The world wants nothing to do with God. If I was to stop coming to church, be in trouble. And we're in danger. We can be in danger of that if we allow the world to, to, to influence us. The, the, the empty philosophies the world believes in. The nonsense that some of the, that the world believes in. And I'm going to tell you, I call all that nonsense because it's not it's Christ's way of thinking. It's a worldly way of thinking. And when I thought the way the world thought, guess what? I acted in my My life was, 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 was nothing. This is why it's so important that we continue to walk in the Spirit. Why it's so important we are reading our Word and staying prayed up. Those are the things that allow us to think and act like Christ. See, the world's philosophies are different from Christ's philosophies. If Christ is in me, then I'm not thinking. If Christ is in me, that am I not thinking like him? Right? I'm thinking like Christ. And Christ is in me. See, because we're gifted with the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, no? So if Christ is in me, that means the Spirit of God is in me. Correct? Amen. So if he's in me, I'm thinking Christ-like. But I live, I live in the world that I don't have a relationship with Jesus and and I haven't accepted him into my heart, I'm thinking worldly life, not Christ life. I got one more point before I close. <laughs> I won't keep you here too long. Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. Hallelujah. There's no longer who, there's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God 
who loved me and gave himself for me. See, one of the keys to entering that narrow gate is we have to crucify ourselves and take on the image of Christ. See, because when we walk in that narrow gate, we're saying, okay, I know that Christ is going to be with me. I know Jesus is with me. He's going to walk along that path with me. He's in me. Now I'm choosing that narrow gate. So guess what? Those obstacles, those speed bumps, those potholes, they're going to be hard, but they're not going to be as hard as they should be. So I'll close there. And my question tonight before is, <laughs> which gate are you going to choose? We have to make a choice. There's, there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We have to make a choice. Either we're going to choose the right gate, or we're going to choose the narrow gate. I choose the narrow gate because I love Jesus, and I know Jesus loves me. And I know that on this, and it, I walk through this little gate, he's not going to leave me by myself to face whatever I need to face alone. But if we choose that white gate, man, it can get lonely sometimes. Right? It can get lonely sometimes. I don't know about you. You have no other options. Like I said earlier, I really feel like God is, is tugging at the church. To say it's time that you make a decision. It's time that you say, okay, there's no middle ground. The other day, the Lord convicted me. I had on my, my music, my Spotify, my playlist, everything. I had my, my, my music. I had worldly music, secular music. It's just stuff that I grew up in, it's stuff that I downloaded. I actually came home to church this day and I deleted everything from my phone. Everything. I have no more secular music in my phone. All the rap, from the worldly rap is gone. All the worldly hip hop is gone. And it's just something that God dealt with me because it says I have to make a decision. I can't have one foot here and one foot here. And then be up here preaching the word. That's just something that God dealt with me in. And I know that he deals with that. a lot of people in other areas. Mm -hmm. It's time that we make a decision. Mm -hmm. We can't have the best of both worlds. We can't. The world thinks we can. But we can't. So I'll close there tonight. God bless everybody out there in the Facebook world. And I just hope that tonight's word, that tonight's word spoke to somebody. Amen. You know, I didn't know how it was going to go forth, but I, I, I hope it spoke to somebody's heart. Good message. So we'll close tonight in the word of prayer.